Ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, uh, welcome again to the March edition of the Directors SOAS Directors Lecture Series. Today, of course, we are going to be discussing how Europe underdeveloped Africa and the Caribbean, the reparations debate uh, with Zainab Badawi, of course, and Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. We will have a discussion for about 45 minutes, uh, followed by Q&A, so please submit your questions on the Padlet, the link to the Padlet is in the chat box. Uh, today's event will be recorded and shared on SOAS's YouTube platform. Please use the following hashtag, hashtag SOAS, if you are uh, engaging social media uh, on the lecture that, that is about to happen. I do wanna kick off, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, uh, to say right at the outset, that today's uh, event is in honor of Walter Rodney. Walter Rodney is perhaps Soaz's or one of Soaz's most distinguished alumni. Um, and today he would have been 80 uh, had he not been uh, so tragically assassinated uh, in 1980. Uh, it's also in March is the 50th anniversary uh, of his incredible book, How Europe Underdeveloped uh, Africa. And, and today I was speaking to a colleague, Ida, from the Center for African Studies and the School for Languages, Culture and Linguistics. And she reminded me essentially that the first version of this book was published uh, by a press in Tanzania. And I was quite struck by that because often we think that the knowledge of our world is produced in the West. But some of the great ideas, ideas that Walter and many others pioneered came from activist scholars from the African continent who were informed by the inspirational struggles of Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and more broadly, the developing world. But as importantly, it was the institutions of those parts of the world that created were the first transmitters of these ideas to the West itself. And so it's something that we should remember as we adopt a new strategic plan at SOAS, where we wanna bring SOAS an institution in a global city at the heart of the UK in London. We want to use and ensure that we enable SOAS to partner with universities in Africa, Asia, the Middle East and the Caribbean so that we transform higher education. We reimagine higher education on a transcontinental platform where we bring global science, global ideas, and local experiences in conversation so we can es establish a more equitable partnership and institutional globe, and a global academy that is more equal. That's the purpose of the strategic plan. And in a sense, uh, it seems to me Walter Rodney would, would smile wherever he is at that strategic plan becoming the center of, of SOAS's agenda, his university after all. And so uh, we honor uh, him today with this discussion. It is going to be by, um, uh, it, it's going to be by Zainab Badawi and of course, Sir Hilary Beckles. Zainab is uh, one of Britain's most um, well-known broadcasters, journalists. She is a SOAS alumni, like uh, Walter Rodney was, and is of course the current president of, uh, of SOAS. Um, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles is vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies. He's a distinguished university administrator, economic historian, specialist in higher education and, and development thinking and practice. And he's an internationally reputed historian. Um, he's been the vice president of the International Task Force for the UNESCO Slave Route Project, a consultant for the UNESCO Cities for Peace Global Program, an advisor on the UN World Culture Report, and was member of the Secretary General of the United States Ban Ki-moon's Science Advisory Board on Sustainable Development. So I'm going to hand over to Zainab and Hillary. This week. We're going to have a fantastic debate and I'll probably come back right in the last couple of minutes. So thank you, I'll hand the platform over to Zainab and Hillary himself. 
Thank you so much indeed, um, Adam, for that introduction. Hilary, hello. It's lovely to see you. Um, I saw Hilary not that long ago in his uh, native Barbados, and um, I think that, Hilary, I must have had some of the most stimulating conversations with you that I've ever had um, in my life. Such a, a brilliant mind, and I'm so, so glad to be um, chairing this discussion with you about um, your new book, How Britain Underdeveloped the Caribbean, a reparation response to Europe's legacy of plunder and poverty. You're telling it as it is, you're not holding back, are you, Hillary? Anyway, Hillary, um, I know you wear many hats, but in particular, what's relevant for our conversation today is that you are chair of a CARICOM commission, and CARICOM, of course, is the community of Caribbean nations, a CARICOM commission seeking justice and reparations for people of African descent. So before we start talking about your book and the arguments for reparations, let's just have uh, some comments from you about Walter Rodney's groundbreaking, prescient, prophetic, um, you know, uh, book, um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. You say that it has since served as a manifesto for a clarion call to Africans to reject the neo-colonial narrative of self-doubt. So just expand on that a little bit for us. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Zainab. Uh, what a tremendous honor and, and joy it is to be uh, in your company once again and, and to thank Adam, of course, for hosting me within the, within the, so, the SOAS family, which I'm very proud of long legacy and uh, this transcontinental conversation um, based in Jamaica at the moment, uh, reaching across the Atlantic to discuss with you issues about the global South and the, and the world as we have it. And, and to reflect on the legacy and the journey of, of, of Walter Rodney. Um, he was a first class honors student in history here, here at the Mona campus of the university in Jamaica before he took a scholarship to, to go across the Atlantic to SOAS where, where he enjoyed uh, his research tremendously. And then of course he was denied uh, admission uh, back into Jamaica in 68 because he, he had started the process of teaching African history to the, na to the neighborhood. <laughs> to go in, go in beyond the perimeter of the campus into the communities and having these, these nightly lectures on African history. And he was declared to be a security risk and therefore was uh, denied admission to Jamaica. And uh, he went on to Tanzania where uh, Adam indicated quite correctly that he entered a period of tremendous intellectual fertility and he wrote a great deal. And, while in Tanzania there, he really emerged as a brilliant uh, uh, historian. So this, this moment of reflection is, is priceless, certainly for me, and I'm sure for you also. So just um, picking up the point I made to you, what do you mean by his book served as a clarion call uh, to Africans to reject the neo-colonial narrative of self-doubt? What made you say that? Well, this, this is precisely, this is precisely the, the critical moment. Uh, having struggled um, for, for this sovereignty, this, this independence, uh, having rejected the colonial structures and the colonial forms and emerged as independent African nation states as we did in the Caribbean also. The question then is what, what do you do now? Um, the, the, the notion that um, the development models of the future are right there within the debris of colonization. And all you have to do is to, is to emulate what you were taught as, as colonials. But Walter was of the view, know that you know, the sustainable development can be achieved only in the context of reattachment to indigenous forms of development and comprehension and knowledge and understanding. And therefore this insistence upon returning to the indigenous mentality to discover your own history, your literature, to discover your economics and to, up, to uproot colonialism uh, from your academy and from your systems of learning and research 
And Walter said that's what has to be done. And he was quite correct because colonial elites were quite prepared to go along with the paradigm of being appendices, appendages and, 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 and outposts of, of the Western economy. He insisted upon a rupture and it had to be, first of all, epistemological, it had to be intellectual, that African people themselves, whether in governance of academia, had to detach themselves from the colonial scaffold and begin to think indigenously as natives of a continent with a tremendously rich history. And that is what he insisted upon. And that is why I think he became quite a dangerous person uh, for, for those internally who were quite prepared uh, to maintain as much of the status quo as possible within the context of this formal independence. Sure. I mean, his message essentially is one that, you know, Africa has institutions, customs, traditions, beliefs, practices that are worthy of respect and preservation. Very, very important message. So let's look at your book, which I have read, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I think it's going to be as iconic a book as, um, as Walter Rodney's was, because it's just packed with so many facts and figures, but written in such a simple, accessible, evocative style. So anybody on this webinar, I do heartily recommend that you read it. Um, so essentially your book um, says, it sets out how and why the former colonial power, Britain in the Caribbean should be held to account for imperial plunder and slavery. And it's also a global call for reparations as part of a new development discourse. But do the two necessarily go hand in hand? Would it not be sufficient for us to just have recognition of the first? Does it have to be sanctioned with the, with the reparations? Can you not just get the, the, the understanding, the apology, the regret? Well, the, the critical thing is to recognize where you are uh, in terms of the, the evolution of ideas that are shaping your society. Uh, Britain implemented um, uh, an emancipation model that laid the foundation for the underdevelopment, the, 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 the institutional underdevelopment of the Caribbean. And we have to address why it is that Britain did what it did. And to speak about development, the first thing is that the, the emancipated people, all 700,000 of them, were demanding compensation when the British Parliament was debating emancipation. So the Caribbean people were saying, if you're going to pay compensation to the slave owners, how about us? whose labor you have exploited for 300 years. So the emancipated started the first campaign to demand reparatory justice. And they were told to shut up and be quiet, that your emancipation is your compensation, so shut up and be quiet. But the voice of these emancipated people resonated through the Caribbean and through the British parliament and found traction in the British Parliament. I mean, people like, like Thomas Buxton uh, gave eloquent speeches uh, in the British Parliament when he was saying, listen, we are paying compensation to the criminals who have committed crimes. I am standing with the black people of the Caribbean who have a right to receive reparations and I'm standing with them. They should be compensated. So there was a movement in the parliament but of course, when the votes came in, it was said, you know, the black folks ought to be quiet and be still, and we're going to give compensation to the enslavers. Now, fast forward a hundred years, the people of the Caribbean have revolted against British colonialism, and every island of the Caribbean between 1934 and 1938, celebrating the centenary of emancipation, the Caribbean rose up in opposition to British colonialism from island to island. And of course, the British then had to use the army to crush this, this movement. And they crushed it very aggressively 
uh, from Belize through to Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, Antigua, the British Army went, went AWOL, <laughs> um, just killing black people. Now, at that moment, Sir Arthur Lewis, who had graduated out of London, returned to the Caribbean in 1939 and said, okay, the people are demanding the end of colonization and they are demanding development. And he wrote this magnificent little book and then said, okay, you the Caribbean people, you want development. You want economic development, you want social justice, you want, it, you want independence, you want an end to colonialism, fine. I am with you, but how are you going to fund it? <laughs> And they asked the question, how are we in the Caribbean going to fund development? He said, well, the first, the first point of call has to be the British government. Because the British government, he said, has had 200 years of free labor from 20 million people that funded British economic development. So the first thing you need to do is to call upon the British government to return a portion of that. And if the British government will return a portion of that, it could be used to fund, it could be used to fund development in the Caribbean. He said, but don't expect it. Don't expect it. Don't expect it because they're not going to be willing to admit to that responsibility. Then the conversation started. So we need a carpet. We need a huge carpet to brush all of this stuff under right. and then we can move on. But we have not been able to find a carpet big enough to brush this stuff under. It keeps bubbling up that we need development and there's a British debt and Britain needs to acknowledge that debt and participate in the development model to finance that debt. So it's an outstanding debt in the name of those 700,000 emancipated slaves in 1834, that the 16 million people in, living in the Caribbean today, or people of Caribbean uh, nationality, they, these 16 million should get some development aid because of the 700,000 enslaved ancestors who were emancipated. It, it's that debt from, 1834 that you're calling for. And it's not just that, uh, Zainab. That's part one of it. For a hundred years after emancipation, right into the 1930s, we've had a Caribbean community that has been calling for democracy, that have been calling for economic development. And the British response a hundred years after, right into my own lifetime, was always to respond either with aggressive militarism to shut down protest movements by force of arms and then to offer aid in contrast to development funding. So we speak of the 19th century Caribbean right into the middle of the 20th century as the Caribbean people dying for democracy. Now, when we say dying for democracy, we make that literally. More people in the Caribbean were massacred by the British army and the British colonial government in the hundred years after emancipation than in the hundred years before emancipation. So the emancipation century was a bloodbath. A few days ago, we were uh, having a seminar here uh, on the campus about the many bloodbaths. St. Vincent, you know, 1856, uh, Jamaica, 1865, Barbados, you know, uh, 18, 1887. And you can continue all the way through. Each time an island said, we want land reform. We want economic development. We want schools. We want hospitals. Each time the people rose up, for basic development infrastructure, the British government sent into army. So development discourse is deeply rooted in what happened at emancipation and into the present time. So it's all connected. It's not just the so-called remoteness of slavery. It's what happened after into my own lifetime in the Caribbean, where we have islands 
where two to 3% of the white population owned 90% of the wealth. And that was a model that the British army enforced upon the Caribbean, despite indigenous efforts to promote development through reform, land reform, social infrastructure, economic diversification, access to education, all of these development infrastructures that Caribbean people call upon the British government, they were all based upon the notion of this ongoing debt. You owe a debt so that when, when the independence generation came and by the 1960s, it was clear that Britain could not hold on to Caribbean colonialism. The leaders came to Britain in the 1960s, one after the other, and all of those conversations for development were speaking about the debt that is owed. How are we going to fund independence? There's a debt that has been owed. And Britain's position was, we owe you nothing. Right. We, we are going to, we're going to exit colonialism on the cheap. We owe you nothing. You are on your own. So you, you are, as I said, as chair of the Commission for Reparations, CARICOM, you've got a set of steps that you want, including these requests, demands for uh, the debt, as you put it, to be repaid. But the first step you want is a full formal apology from uh, the British and the other colonial authorities in the Caribbean, the French, for instance. But you know you're not going to get that, are you? Because that would trigger... Um, litigation, it would trigger steps. So that's why I go back to my original question, which is, isn't it better in a sense to just get expressions of regret, first of all, to acknowledge that these crimes against humanity were actually committed? I mean, David Cameron, when he went and visited Jamaica in 2015, he said, I do hope that as friends, we have gone through so much together since those darkest times and that we can move on from this painful legacy. So there is an acknowledgement, isn't there, amongst British political establishment, painful legacy? Is that <laughs> well, no, no. Uh, we, we all want to move on, but you have to move on with accountability, responsibility and justice. We all want to move on. But first of all, you must acknowledge the notion of a statement of regret is something, regretfully, that I will never be a part of. And I think anyone who understands, who understands the search for accountability would reject that. Um, let me give you the distinction, and I will frame it to you uh, metaphorically. Imagine you are sitting on uh, the platform uh, about to board your subway to go to work, and, and a huge man, uh, you know, 300 pounds steps on your foot and uh, you are diabetic and your foot is um, damaged and it doesn't heal and you find yourself in a hospital and, uh, and you, 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 you've lost your foot, it's been amputated. Now, the gentleman comes to you and he says, listen, there are two choices. I can say to you, I regret that I've stepped on your foot. Here's a hundred pounds as an expression of my regret now and goodbye <laughs> and goodbye you're on your own goodbye he could also say listen i've stepped on your foot you've lost the use of that of that limb i am very concerned about your future but i want to take responsibility for what i've done to you and not only will i visit you in the hospital but i i would want to find a way to help you with your rehabilitation. Maybe there's something I can do to help you with your rehabilitation so you could get back into the workforce and you could get back on with your lives. And I want to be there to assist you to return you to the state you were in so you could get on with your lives. Now you will then have to decide, Zeynep, would you rather the first position, here's a hundred pounds, go away and goodbye. Or would you rather a rehabilitative accountable, responsible engagement to help you back on your feet so you could get on with your life. That is, the second one is the apology. The first one is a statement of regret. No victim will ever accept a statement of regret if they have a choice. I'm, I was being devil's advocate for you because <laughs> there is That's that. Okay. You hear it from British cabinet ministers like, you know, Roy, yeah. 
with the former British International Development Secretary, who says, look, I want to target UK development aid to the poorest people in the world, rather than paying reparations in the belief that we're going to somehow undo 300 or 400 years of colonial history in writing checks to people. You know, there is that view out there, which... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so far, you 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 know, you've not won the arguments. Perhaps in um, in setting out the arguments in this book, you will, because there are some really very startling figures in it. I remember reading how you you said six hundred thousand enslaved Africans were taken to your native Barbados from sixteen twenty one, when um, slavery you know started in Barbados, and in eighteen thirty four, when emancipation legislation eventually. Um, led to the freedom, as it were, of these people, there were 83,000 left. So, I mean, you know, people who died, they hadn't left. I mean, it's it, the, the scale of uh, death and destruction really does, uh, you know, beg a belief. But well, in, you know, Zainab, Zainab, yes. it's a question of accepting your own history. The British people have not been taught effectively about the things they did beyond their own borders. The things they did to secure development, the things they did beyond their own shores to bring home the wealth, to fund their own development. The British government over the decades, over the centuries have protected the British people, not protected, have shielded them, I should say, from any knowledge of what their nation did. So. Does the average person know that slavery was genocide? That Britain committed not only the crime of de de denying people their humanity by uh, defining them as property, chattel, and real estate, but do they know that it was also genocidal? I mean, they come to Barbados on holiday and they love Barbados, but do they know that this is where genocide was committed by their, by their governments and their private sectors and so on? It's a question of accepting your own, your own history. Take, for example, the Treaty of Versailles. Mm. Britain held Germany to account for the First World War and insisted that they pay reparations. They insisted that they pay reparations. And when the Prime Minister Lloyd George and when the reparations deal was settled, they told Germany, you have to pay 31 billion US dollars for the harm and suffering you inflicted upon Britain and other countries. So they held Germany to account. And while they were holding Germany account to pay reparations for the damages of the First World War, the Caribbean was also asking for reparations at the same time. Marcus Garvey was organizing a reparations campaign the same way you got reparations from the German people, pay reparations for what you have done and continue to do in the Caribbean. So it's a double standard. It has always been a double standard. After the war, the Second World War, Britain got the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. It was recognized that Britain could not rebuild itself on the basis of its own resources and needed a Marshall Plan, a development plan to put Britain back on its feet. At the same time, delegations from the Caribbean were coming to Britain to say, you know, it's been a hundred years since emancipation. We are now ending colonization. We need a Marshall Plan. These islands cannot get on their own feet without a Marshall Plan. You owe the Caribbean the development plan similar to what you are getting. And of course, they rejected the Caribbean why they accepted their own Marshall Plan. Again, another double standard. And the double standards continue decade after decade up onto this moment we are speaking. Why, why isn't there unity in numbers? I was very struck by last year, the Jamaican Minister for Youth, Culture and Sport, Olivia Grange said, you know, we're hoping for reparatory justice in all its forms. You know, this is well overdue, but better speak with one voice, she said and have one considered position by all people of African descent, be they be in the Caribbean, in Africa, the USA, Brazil, you know, and um, you, you could get together, have that critical mass and have a high level reparation, international reparations summit, but it doesn't seem that there is that 
unity amongst people of all African descent? Well, you know, um, in, in the context of Africa, there were countries that were prepared to wait it out and to negotiate their independence. There were countries that says, we cannot take this anymore, we're going to go to war. And there were always multiple options available in this pursuit for freedom and development. Is uh, because humans are not robots. You know, they, 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 they imagine different things at different moments. And, you know, within a, one country, there are multiple intellectual uh, traditions and decisions that are made. So fine, you, what, uh, what we all know is that there has to be reparatory justice. As I said, there is no carpet big enough to brush us under. It has to be addressed, but the road to that moment uh, will illustrate multiple, multiple terrains. And there is a terrain that is calling for expansion of aid. There's another group that says, we don't want any aid. We want development support with investment. So you have this, this continuous narrative. But critically, critically, this movement is getting larger and larger as we speak. And it is going to continue to embrace the world because the world is calling for accountability, not only for the past, but the present. I was struck when I read some of those documents in the British archives that detail how Caribbean leaders came to Britain to speak with the Macmillan Conservative government to talk about reparations for development. And the correspond the minutes of that meeting when the Jamaican Premier uh, and his delegation, Mr. Bustamante, met with uh, Macmillan. And they said, listen, you have ruled Jamaica for 300 years. You've extracted wealth from Jamaica for 300 years. Jamaica was one of your primary sources of wealth that built Britain. Now, we are about to go to independence and we have 80% illiteracy. This is how you have left us with 80% illiteracy. What can we do to promote economic development with 80% illiteracy? He said, we have schools for only 7% of the children. How are we going to take off with economic transformation and development if we have schools for only 7% of the kids? Now, you need to help us to build some schools. You need to help us to build some hospitals. You need to participate in the development plan for Jamaica after, after your 300 years of plunder and extraction. If you read the correspondence between the various parts of the British government preparing for that meeting, you had cabinet secretaries and permanent secretaries advising the government, now listen, we have to get out of this on the cheap. We have to give them as little as possible. And this is their language. We, yeah. must, let them, we must let them know that we owe them nothing. And we're prepared to give them aid, but we're not prepared to give them development funding. So you know, it's all there. Yeah, yeah, but just flipping it, why don't you, why isn't there, you know, as I said, strength in unity? Why are people of African descent or Africans living on the continent of Africa all come together with a very clear set of demands? You hear different things, you know, in America, the most, you know, visible African diaspora in the world, you get some calls for everybody who is an African-American, regardless of how wealthy they are, Oprah Winfrey, whatever, should get that bag of money as part of a reparatory uh, system. You, you know, so, and, and that brings into, could arguably be, you know, it, it kind of undermines the argument that you're making. So why don't you as an influential voice say, we've all got to come together and make a single demand? Well, first of all, I, I don't think it undermines my position at all. It, what it does is to reflect the, the reality that I understand it to be. If you take, for example, this search for unity of which you speak, well, there is no group of people on this planet who have had their leaders assassinated at the rate and with the intensity as the black people. 
In other words, when the black leaders, the intellectuals, when they come together to do exactly what you're calling for, we have had a mortality rate among black intellectuals and leaders. That is phenomenal. And it goes back to slavery right there in London in the British archives. There are instructions from Whitehall out to West Africa that would say, the chief of this community is opposed to our slave trade. The chief is opposed. You have permission to eliminate him. So from way back then, we have, we've had these these political assassinations, it's a, it's a critical part of, of our journey. So this, this search, this search for the one voice of which you speak is a very painful search in terms of mortality. And why? Why have there been assassinating the black leaders at this rate uh, uh, across the continents? Because of course, to achieve that objective is almost an impossibility in the context of the distribution of power. And those of us who are calling for justice and democracy uh, are, are seen really as, as idealists. So reparation is not idealistic. Reparation yeah. is it, going to be a part of the restructuring of the modern world. But just picking up on this leadership issue, you do have a vice president in the United States, Kamala Harris, whose father is Jamaican. Um, and, and the current administration has shown itself to be somewhat sympathetic towards the idea of reparations. You know, last year, the Judiciary uh, Committee of the House of Representatives held a vote on a bill that would create a federal commission uh, to study, as it put it, the lingering negative effects of the institution of slavery in the US, looking at various economic, political, educational and social discrimination and to develop, as it said, some appropriate remedies, including perhaps potential reparations. So do you think that there is now some movement in the United States? Well, let's put it this way. For a hundred years, civil society in the Caribbean had been calling for reparations for a hundred years. The governments of the Caribbean never supported this request. They were not part of it. Each time they tried to negotiate with the British government and the British government just brushed them aside, they would return to the Caribbean and said, well, let us get on with it. Recently, however, circumstances have changed. And for the first time, 2013, the Caribbean governments all came together and said, let us speak with one voice. And this is what they did. They said, let us speak with one voice on this matter because we have been forced to divide and rule for a hundred years. So now let us transcend divide and rule and speak with one voice. This is when they established the CARICOM Reparations Commission. And I've been asked to be the chair of that. We moved from the Caribbean and went to North America and tried to revitalize the reparations movement there. They saw the CARICOM model as a, a, an opportunity to revitalize the American movement. And boy, was it revitalized on the basis of the Caribbean experience. And they said, if 18 or 20 Caribbean governments can do this, why can't we do this here? And the campaign started in the Democratic Party and the grassroots organizations. And before you know it, it was in the Congress. Now, that's a tremendous development of unity between the Caribbean and North America. Now, last year, for the first time, the governments of Africa and the governments of the Caribbean met in a summit for the first time. And this was a tremendous achievement to bring the African governments and the Caribbean governments into, into a summit and their resolve that this will be an annual summit from here on in because the search for that one voice between the Caribbean diaspora and Africa is precisely what this summit is going to achieve. The government of Kenya has just requested that I put together a summit in Kenya of black intellectuals, black advocates, grassroots organizers to come to Africa to talk about Pan-African reparations. 
and we are speaking about this. We are going to have this in this summit of authors, advocates, writers, grassroots organizers to speak about reparations in African policy. So all the elements are coming together because there is a realization, there is a realization of the inevitability. The European Union Parliament passed a resolution last year to say yes, that we know of the crimes that were committed by the European nations and the European states in Africa, the Caribbean. So we are aware and we are resolved to a reparatory justice path. The issue for the European Union Parliament is to decide, decide on the modalities, how and what. And of course, that's when the division began to occur. But the point is, you agree in principle that there has to be a reparatory justice path. I don't know how long it will take to decide among themselves a consensus on what that path should be, but there is a decision that has been taken. Right, interesting. So there's some momentum building up. So, and by the way, I will go to the questions on the Padlet shortly because we have we are getting a few. But if you've got any um, anybody on this webinar listening to this and some of the things that Hillary has raised, please do um, ask him to expand on them in the in the um, the question um, device. Uh, so you you set up very clearly in our conversation so far how and why former colonial powers such as Britain should be held to account for that imperial plunder and slavery and crimes against humanity and, and set in, in context for us how global calls for reparations as part of a kind of new development discourse are gaining momentum. But I wonder if you could just explain to us how this is all relevant to the current conversations that we're all having, um, trying to imagine a new global economic order um, you know, how does it all, all, all fit in? Because um, you say quite clearly that the plight, economic plight of the Caribbean and Africa is still continuing. So explain to us why that is and how the thesis of your book can be made relevant to current conversations about reimagining the global economic order. Well, if we, if we return to, to Walter's, Walter's paradigm, how Europe underdeveloped Africa and the, the underdevelopment uh, theory uh, that was very prominent in the, in the, in the 70s and, and, and 80s to ex explain the failure of Africa to rebound in the generation after, after independence and the underdevelopment theory, international trade, continuing domination of resource ownership and management, inadequate infrastructures and all of that. I mean, the conversation of Walter 50 years ago was very infrastructural. But the development discourse have shifted once again. And at the moment, the poverty of Africa and to some extent the Caribbean, the explanation has come now as a pushback. And here's a pushback. You are poor and underdeveloped, largely because you're Black, largely because you have no culture of economic management and skill and skill development. You are poor and undeveloped, largely because of your own ineptitude, your inability to find within your culture the energy and capacity to transform your reality and to grow. So basically, dominant in the literature at the moment is the counter narrative that locates poverty in the developing world in terms of the culture of the indigenous people, those who were brought in uh, as well. So blame the victim. What the reparatory justice movement does is counter that counter narrative by saying, hold on a second. You cannot tell us about our culture, about our intellectual ineptitude. You cannot use those white supremacy racist arguments that Europe transcended the world because of its culture. You cannot, because we know what you did. We know the history of the plunder. So let us talk, let us talk logically about the issue of wealth extraction. Let us talk about political domination. Let us talk about economic ownership as the basis of the circumstances in which you have left the world. And so you use your Bretton Woods institutions, you use the IMF and the World Bank 
And we all know what the IMF and the World Bank did to developing countries. They actually helped to further ravish them and push them back further in the development trajectory. So these institutions that were meant to be a part of the Western world's continued accumulation were partners in the further impoverishment of developing countries. The legacy of the IMF and developing countries is horrific. The legacy of the World Bank economic prescriptions in the developing countries have been horrific. All of that has now been exploded by solid empirical research. So developing countries are saying now, we need a level playing field. To have a shot at democracy and development, we need a level playing field. We need participation and partnership. We do not need aid as a methodology. We need development, funding, and finance. The reparatory justice movement within that broader context is saying, and yes, yes, there is an unpaid debt that has to be a part of that negotiation. And it cannot be settled in the conversation about aid. It has to be settled in a conversation about responsibility, accountability, partnership, democracy building, and the ethics of future partnerships. So the, repar the reparatory justice movement is a democracy movement. It's a, it's a social justice movement. It's, a, it's an equity movement. It's a movement that says, listen, as human beings, we can do better than this. We can do better than this. We can, we can move to a higher level of human interaction that makes this 21st century a much more peaceful place in which to dwell. That's lovely. Thank you, Hilary. So I've um, hogged you and monopolized you enough. Let's look at some of the questions that we're getting in. Let me give you this one. Why does the reparations committee not focus on a development bank, a development bank for small and medium sized businesses with a branch in every Caribbean island financed from the old colonial powers? That would be the best reparations imaginable. That's from Dr. Roger Van Zwanenberg. Not everybody here has actually given their name, but that's one there. What do you think of that idea, a, a kind of reparations development bank? The, the CARICOM Reparations Commission had been focusing on working through with the major financial institutions uh, in the Western world that were a critical part of this extraction history. The city of London, for example, has accepted that their banks and their insurance companies were at the center of these crimes. And we have reached out to them. There is a, a very guarded admission of culpability and they have insisted that they would love to have a conversation around the margins of the subject. In other words, we would like to give a little money to black organizations in London and schools. And we want to, we want to focus on you know, giving uh, a, an endowment uh, to a grassroots organization in Tutumbek or, or, or have some, somewhere. And, and there's that kind of marginalist approach and they would reach out to us and says, what do you think about that? So you have lawyers of London that made billions insuring black people as slaves. They insured the slave ships. They made all of their money and they became a great insurance company, the best, the best in the world and the biggest in the world because they were insuring the slaves and the slave ships. And they would say, they would put on their website, oh yes, mate, that is true. And, but we, we have, a, we have a, a, a social citizens program in which we are giving um, um, some charity to a few, a few institutions in London. Hold on a second. We have Barclays Bank, all of them, National Westminster Bank, the Bank, the Royal Bank of Scotland. And we have approached all of them to have a conversation to talk about a financial package and strategy that would allow for investment in the region. You know, but there is still this consciousness, and it's a white supremacy thing, you know, that we will control the terms and conditions of our negotiations with you. It is not a conversation. We will tell you, we will give you something on the side and you take it and go away because they're, 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 they're committed to this 
regret as opposed to reparations conversations. Yes. And that really is the problem. So you're referring to, I know in 2020, the insurance company Lloyd's, they um, apologized for their role in the transatlantic slave trade and offered donations, contributions to charities that promote diversity and inclusion. And that you're saying just is not really what you're about. We, we found that offensive because the, the, the Caribbean people are talking about investments in, in schools and in colleges, uh, digital technology. They're talking about public health, you know, this legacy of, of hypertension and diabetes. The black people in the Caribbean, uh, Zainab, if you, if you use the marker of chronic diseases, uh, non-communicable chronic diseases, if you use that marker, the Black people in the Caribbean are the sickest people in the world because we have the highest, we have the highest ratios in our adult population of diabetes hypertension. And why is that? Is it there's some kind of genetic flaw that Black people in the Caribbean have? It has to do with slavery, sugar, salt, 400 years of consuming salt and sugar as meals every day. The psychological stress of colonization and racism and white supremacy. And this is what it's all about, the intergenerational transmission of sickness and disease. Now, we will have to talk about research and we would like to talk about turning this around. Yes, we have, we have the science, we have the technology, but do we have the infrastructures to make a big impact upon rehabilitating the health of these people who are the descendants of enslaved people? We are speaking about partnership. We are speaking about collaborative interaction to move humanity forward. The white supremacy mentality in corporate Europe and corporate Britain is indeed the primary obstacle to these developments that we are asking for. Make that clear, thank you. Another question here, is seeking reparations simply now a holy grail that keeps us from putting energy into commercial and economic endeavors that could produce far more than could ever be claimed in reparations? Yes, it is always, it is always the response that says, listen, how do we, how do we discredit reparations. You remember back in the 60s when Martin Luther King was talking about integration. And he was talking about the integration of the house in stock, the integration of schools, the integration of financial institutions, how to get black people to be integrated into the economic systems. Well, the white supremacy group says, okay, we know what he means by reparation, by, by integration. What he really mean is that black men want to marry white women. <laughs> and they counter define integration as sexual integration and put Martin Luther King to in a circumstance where he had to say, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about economic integration now. The white supremacy group has said, oh, reparations is about black people standing around on street corners, wanting handouts from white people and not wanting to take responsibility for themselves. That was how white supremacy defined reparations in an effort to discredit the value of it. We've had to say, hold on a second, that is your narrative. Reparations is about the partnership between two groups of people who have had an unequal and unequal extractive relationship. And there is a search for rebalancing. There's a research, there's a surge for justice. This is what this is all about. So yes, the Caribbean, I should tell you, if you look at the mess that Britain left the Caribbean in, in the 60s, and the 60s, the, the 1960s is when the independence movement started. The Caribbean people were told you are on your own, no development support, no development financing, get on with it. Caribbean people have been extremely responsible 
and taking care of themselves. The, the self-help, we have converted these colonies into viable democratic nations. Barbados is seen as one of the freest societies in the world because of a commitment to democracy. Jamaica is seen as a country that has converted a horrendous history into a viable nation state where people can live and where society can be respected. So the Caribbean people have done a great deal to achieve a modernity on the basis of scarce resources and to take responsibility for self-help. The question is, if the Caribbean had at its back, in addition to this self-help and self-responsibility, if they had also had a leg up from the British government and the British private sector, if they had a leg up, how much further along they would have been in resolving this, this ethical and moral conundrum in which we find ourselves. And therein lies the problem. Right. Um, a question here. Um, it says, I'm one of the most passionate supporters of reparations and at the risk of sounding combative since CARICOM is now leading this charge. Do you think it would strengthen the call if CARICOM started the process by carrying out reparatory justice within its own respective borders? Uh, the first order of business could be divesting the state of crown lands and introducing radical land reform distribution to the descendants of the former enslaved. If land ownership is empowerment, then wouldn't that be beginning to help repair the damage of emancipation? Well, this is precisely what Caribbean independence and development has been about. Independence in the Caribbean has been a reparatory justice project. The development of the Caribbean left alone and still being exploited was a reparatory justice project. If you take, take my university of the West Indies, for example, I have the pleasure of leading. The British government planted a seed in the Caribbean, a university seed in 1948. The generation before, Lloyd George as prime minister had said, that the Caribbean is the slum of the British Empire. He was speaking as prime minister and he's reflecting on the British Empire and described the Caribbean as the slum, the slum of the British Empire, because it was recognized that the public health of the people in the Caribbean was the worst in the British Empire. Now, as a response to the revolt of the Caribbean people, they said, let us build in the Caribbean, a small medical school. And we will fund for them a small medical school that will begin to look at the diseases that are ravishing the public health in the region. That was 1948. A small grant, a few, a few dozen students. The college was placed under the tutelage of London University. So we were a college of the University of London, small tutelage. Next year, this university is celebrating 75 years of service. But it's the Caribbean people who took this small imperial college, as it was called, took this small imperial college and built it on the basis of its own resources and responsibility into a university of 50,000 students that is now classified in the top 1.5% of the best universities in the world. And how was that achieved? That was achieved by Caribbean people taking responsibility for their own future, building up collectively a major institution Thanking, thanking the British benefactor for their investment, but saying, okay, we can take it from here. Now, of course, Caribbean development has been precisely about that. Caribbean people repairing through self-help the damage done under colonialism. And, re and remember, you know, colonialism is not over there are still British colonies in the Caribbean. The Caribbean is still 
the part of the world that has colonies. The British have colonies in the Caribbean. The French have colonies in the Caribbean. The Dutch have colonies in the Caribbean. The Caribbean remains the most colonized part of the world. And this is where colonization started. Columbus came into this region and started the juggernaut of colonization. But it is not over. It is not over, my friends. We are still dealing with colonization every day in the Caribbean world. It is unjust and it's immoral. I mean, lots of questions coming. You won't be able to get through all of them, but there's another question here about the underdevelopment. The reason is many pe people blame Africa's underdevelopment on the resource curse. What is your stance on this? Well, I don't know if having ample resources is a curse. It's, it's the way in which you are able to utilize those resources in, in, in an effective way. Um, the development comes with side effects that are the result of investor attitudes, views about society, views about community development. And if you, if you only have to remember Britain in the 19th century with the factory revolution and uh, the coal mines and, and all of that environmental pollution that def defined Victorian Britain, not only the children, how they were used as cheap labor, but also how the environment was polluted and communities were devastated by the side effects of industrialization. So, you know, at different moments of history, you have these, you have these challenges. Uh, it is not appropriate for, for uh, people in the Western world to ignore their own history. And this is what reparations is all about. You cannot ignore your own history and hold other people to an account that you yourself were fundamentally the primary breachers of those standards. It is always a double standard that we have to reflect upon. And the search for justice and for equity always require that we all bring our history to the table so that we can adjudicate and find a good balance for, for favorable partner. Right, another question here on, and it's how strong would be the present debate on the need for European reparations if most African and Caribbean countries had achieved high levels of human capital development and possessed strong institutions? Well, you know, um, the, the Caribbean is at the crossroads at the moment. Um, in terms of the Americas, the Caribbean, from a development perspective, let us speak about social capital, the development of skills. The Caribbean has the lowest enrollment in post-secondary education in the entire Americas. Less than 15% of the kids in the Caribbean who uh, go to secondary school, uh, enter into post-secondary uh, education. And post-secondary education, not only university, but also skills training, uh, professional development, of course, academic training. Now, with, with that ratio of enrollment in post-secondary education, the potential for this region is significantly suppressed Last year, um, Jamaica Minister of Labor made the statement that only 17% of the workers in Jamaica are in some way certified as having some kind of skill or training. That is the norm across the region. It is chronically low. It's a question of affordability. No government that had access to resources would want to maintain such a labor force. Those of us in higher education have done all we can to promote access to higher education in order to promote economic development, social justice, and social civility. But the plumbing is broken in the basement. If the circumstances around primary education are so awful, and that filters up 
to a catastrophe at the secondary level. Then of course, at the tertiary level, you're gonna have fundamental problems. You're not gonna have the pipeline access. And we know that given all the models of economic development that we have available to us, a country's potential for economic transformation and development is an expression of the, of the number of its citizens who have had skills training, professional development and academic training. And from the point of view of the Caribbean at the lowest points of the Americas, that should tell you what we can reasonably expect to find in the next 10 to 15, 20 years in terms of economic development. What if we had the capacity to break through with that, to fix the educational system in terms of access at the secondary level and to, and to pipeline those people up to the tertiary level and to create the social capital for transformation? What if we had the resources to do that? Reparatory justice conversations to send to Britain. This is a strategy that can be used, can be discussed, whereby you can return a portion of that wealth that you have taken from the Caribbean people and reinvest it in the people who are the descendants of the enslaved and well, the indentured. This is the conversation that we are having right now. This answers a question partly, but it might want just to expand on it on the mechanism. Mechanism. What is your proposed mode of payment with respect to reparations, since many claim that the payment to the descendants of those who were enslaved would be far too complex? The Caribbean methodology is not about individualized approaches to reparatory justice. It's, it's an institutionalized approach. We are talking about investment partnering. We're not speaking about individual accessing uh, extractions through personal narratives. We are speaking about economic investment in partnering. We are speaking about investment in public health, investments in educational infrastructure, investment in agricultural reform to allow those rural communities to be able to develop entrepreneurial options around agriculture. We are speaking about improving the digital infrastructure in the region. Right now, we have a terrible circumstance where the vast majority of the children in the Caribbean region do not have access in their households to, to internet to allow them to participate in education. And during the COVID, we saw the consequences of that. Thousands and thousands of children locked out of education because they do not have internet infrastructures because the investment in putting the infrastructure in place by the private companies uh, is considered to be uneconomical. So we, these are challenges that are real, that are the legacies of colonization. These are the legacies that we are speaking about, the, 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 the fundamental inequalities, the uh, environments that are not suited for economic transformation and so on. We have a circumstance where at least half of the population is considered to be living in ghettos. But this is how they were forced to live on the colonization. They were just strung out across these ghettos. And when COVID came and the governments were saying to people, well, listen, listen, you know, you have to stay, you have to stay in your home. You have to come off the streets. There are curfews, come off the streets, stay in home. But the households, for half of these people are congested households in the ghettos, and the household is the place where you were catching the COVID. And your chance of escaping COVID was to leave your house and come out of the house, go on the street. You were safer on the streets than in your congested houses. So we had these contradictions with respect to public policy and science. So Eventually, people began to take the law into their own hands by coming out of their homes and going on the street. Because the reality is that the home was where the COVID was concentrated. I mean, you bring up COVID, it's, and obviously, uh, Caribbean countries taken a real hammering because they saw their tourism revenues decimated. And uh, I think it's a surprising fact for a lot of people that countries such as Barbados, which qualify as middle income countries, actually do not warrant or merit any development aid from the United Kingdom because they're deemed to be too rich. They're not low-income countries, they're middle-income countries. And so 
don't receive any development aid at all, which- uh, Well, that's, that's, just, that's just a part of that, what we call that white supremacy that was in, embedded in the Bretton Wood agreements, you know, the World Bank, the IMF. They come to your societies and they say, well, okay, there's an elite of very rich people and many of them are British or European citizens. They live in the Caribbean. They sometimes they visit right. the, yeah. in the Caribbean. Yeah. And you have this elite of very wealthy people. Then you do your per capita calculation. Right. And you say, hey, here's the country with a very healthy per capita, yeah. per capita distribution. It, 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 it mask it mask the poverty of the masses. Then the IMF says you're not entitled to this because you know you have this distribution. So yeah, uh, uh, on reparations, another point here: the astounding discovery that the loan taken by the British government to compensate the slave owners who held enslaved Africans was only repaid in 2015. Do you agree that one means reparatory justice could be a tax rebate for all UK tax paying African descendants of our enslaved African ancestors? And just to remind people about those figures, of course, slavery was abolished in 1807. The slave trade rather was abolished in 1807, but slavery not until 1833 and the British government um, repaid, I think, the equivalent of about $10 billion to the former slave owners, and it took out a loan of $20 million in 1833 and didn't repay that until 2015. That's what that's referring to there. So and, and and you know, if you idea there that people of African descendants of enslaved Africans could get a tax rebate. I'm not sure that Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs would accept that, but it's a novel well, idea. It's so important to, to speak of double standards. I'm on record for having said that the British Emancipation Act was the most racist piece of legislation ever passed in the British Parliament. And this is against the background of a belief that it was the most humanitarian piece of legislation ever passed. But what actually happened with that act? The British Parliament, having decided that they were going to pay compensation to the owners of slaves for the loss of their property, had first of all, in the parliament to agree that if you're going to pay property compensation, the, the black people of the Caribbean, the 700,000 enslaved people, had to be first of all classified as property. So first of all, you have to define them as property in order to pay property compensation. And the British government had been dodging that for 200 years. Many of them were saying, well, you know, what they do in the Caribbean is not quite British law. You know, this is, they're doing that slavery malarkey down in the Caribbean. But here in Britain, you know, we, we believe in freedom and there's, there's none of that here now. Well, I mean, another, but, but, oh, yeah, a but, comment. But, but to pay the compensation, they had to classify on the law that the 700,000 black people were not human and property. And the British government did that. In one swoop, defined black people as non-human in order to pay property compensation. And then on top of that, Zainab, what they did, they said, okay, what is the value of the 700,000 blacks in the Caribbean? They did an actuarial calculation. They said they are worth 45 million pounds. That's what they're worth. That's their market value. That's their replacement value. But they said to the slave owners, we're not going to pay you 45 million. We're going to pay you 20 million. And thus they borrowed that 20 million from the Rothschilds and paid 20 million. But the act was designed in such a way that they said, okay, here's 20 million in cash. Question was, well, they're worth 45. So what about the remaining 25 million? The British government said, fine, what we'll do is this. After we have freed them, we're going to make them work for free for another six years. So they will, they will contribute that 25 million in free labor after they have been freed. And that is what the British Act did. So I think the, I black, people, it. the I black people ended up paying 48% well, of the cost of their freedom. 
Yeah, there's a comment here about the Haitians are poor today because they had to pay reparations to their former French enslavers. Reparations were paid to former enslavers. Why is the reverse reparations to the formerly enslaved not possible? That's unfathomable. So a comment there. A quick comment about, because we haven't got much time left now, just a few minutes. So I want to get some of these, just some rapid answers. What about intent? Somebody said that the analogy you gave about the stepping on someone's foot causing the loss of that foot is an analogy that totally ignores the matter of intent. And there was intent in the whole slavery thing. Fair point, yeah? Um, well, intent is not to be discussed. Yeah, okay. And um, so a point here, you've kind of addressed this a bit. How can the call for reparations serve the call for a new international order that supports the thriving and well-being of all people within Earth's regenerative capacity? Um, so that's that there. Um, there's a, a point here, which is um, my question. Taiwan, Singapore and South Korea have respectively made phenomenal strides beyond colonial recognition without recourse to colonial era reparations. Why are Africa and the Caribbean special? You might want to pick that up. By Absolutely. And that's why uh, in my book, there is a chapter called reject the West Indies, support the East Indies. Now, when the West Indians were in London seeking to meet with the British government to discuss a development package for the West Indies, the British government was also at the same time, while rejecting the West Indies, formulating strategies to assist the East Indies because the British government admitted that in the post-war era, the East Indies was more important than the West Indies. And thus in 1950, at the Commonwealth meeting in Colombo, Sri Lanka, they worked out the Colombo plan. The Colombo plan was a Marshall plan for the East Indies colonies. And they made massive investments in the East Indies in exactly the same way that the West Indies were asking for. Mm -hmm. So the, the West Indian plan was rejected, but it was taken and applied to the East Indies to enable India and Singapore and Burma and all the various colonies, Sri Lanka, uh, Ceylon at the time. So the East Indies got the development plan that the West Indies had been calling for. It's called the Colombo plan. And the Colombo plan was magnificent for the East Indies because Britain was able to get Japan and to some extent the United States to contribute towards the Colombo plan in order to help economic transformation of the East Indies. So it's a very good question. Why did the East Indies get the reparation strategy in place? Why not the West Indies? And the argument I presented here is that the politicians in the British parliament and the successive governments were unable to forgive the West Indians for revolting against the British Empire in the 1930s because the West Indian revolt of the 30s triggered an Indian revolt, triggered the African revolt, and they were holding the West Indians responsible for the collapse of the British Empire because within a matter of a decade or two, Asia and Africa were all rising up against, against British rule and demanding independence. But that process was triggered by a, Carib a Caribbean-wide movement of decolonization. I think they wanted to punish the West Indies. And all the information that I have unearthed from the correspondence of British governments, the internal correspondence of the cabinets, they all point to this in its capable conclusion that the white supremacy attitude was hostile to the Caribbean deep into the 20th century. And we would never embrace the way the East Indies were in Colombo with a Colombo plan. If the Caribbean had received a Colombo plan, it would be well ahead today. We'll answer to that. Yeah, I read that chapter. Question here. 
uh, about restitution, which sometimes goes hand in glove with the reparations uh, issue. How important influential was the wonderful late, Ber that's my addition, Bernie Grant, who of course was the Labour MP for Tottenham in North London uh, of Caribbean origin. How important was his Africa reparations movement and the campaign for restitution of violently looted artworks? And that was in the 1990s. We are seeing some movement, aren't we, on this question? question of uh, restitution of looted artworks. And in fact, there was a commission, uh, the Savoy um, Commission in France, which said that 90% of Africa's cultural artifacts reside outside the continent, making some progress in that particular sphere, would you say? Well, you know, every, every inch Along the journey, every every step um, has to be has to be commended because the the headwind, the headwind against taking those small steps is so enormous that if you're able to make one step in the right direction in the in the face of adverse headwinds, you have to say it's, it is better than nothing. However until there is a conversation about the structure of that plunder and the nature of that plunder, that an entire continent could be subject to that kind of pillage and other people benefit from that pillage and come to see pillage as normal. And in the Western world, you know, I've heard the arguments, well, we took them to protect them. Yeah. You know, we took them to save them so that the people who produce the art are now going to be savages to destroy what they have produced. And you have this, this circular argument that absolutely speaks to a certain kind of mindset. And normally, movement. normally people who possess that mindset cannot see themselves critically. Yeah, it was the 2018 SARS Savoy report commissioned by the French government that found that 90% of Africa's cultural legacy lay outside the continent. I was trying to remember the other part of the Savoy bit, Sar Savoy. Um, somebody here, I'll just take it as a comment um, and says, how would Africa have developed by now? I understand that the abundance of resources that it had would likely have led it to perhaps being another superpower, but would the resource curse be more the more likely result? You've already answered a question on the resource curse, but this person also says, P.S. I've started reading your book since yesterday, and I must agree with Zainab Badawi. It's gripped me as an iconic masterpiece. There you go. Um, let me, I think we're, we're coming close to time. So I, I'll just give you this. Uh, two people have asked the same question. Deb from Nigeria. What inspired you to write this book? And do you think, did you think it will make this much impact? It's only just out. And same question, what motivated you to choose this topic to write your book? And what's, what were some of the limitations? Not quite sure you can take that how. Um, well, many years ago, when I started my academic career, I, the courses I taught, um, when I was in the UK, I taught a course, the Comparative Economic Development of Britain and Japan. So that's how I started looking at uh, British industrialization, Japanese industrialization, and why these two countries were able to achieve phenomenal uh, economic growth in the 19th and 20th centuries. When I returned to the Caribbean, I started to teach Caribbean economic history to explain this persistent poverty in the Caribbean and why it is structurally unable to emerge out of this, out of this and this underdevelopment structures and realized that the one way I could pay respect to Walter Ronnie that was lasting was to endorse and validate the logic of his analysis, the depth of his research. Because I believe that at the time Walter's book was published uh, in the 70s, the world was not ready for that book. That book was ahead of its time. The world was not ready for it. And to some extent, Walter Rodney's reputation as a brilliant scholar uh, did not get the kind of varnish that he was entitled to because he was so ahead of his time. What we have seen since then has been the emergence of the recognition 
of the vision of a brilliant young man who was looking for humanity to transcend and bring moral order to the world. And he was a humanist, uh, fundamentally so. So writing this book was to bring that paradigm into the Caribbean circumstance and to show the similarities between the African issues and the Caribbean issues. But importantly, you know, this, this was going to be my retirement book. And I had intended to write this book in retirement, take my good old time and write it. But then so many friends and colleagues were uh, being the victims of COVID. Uh, in my university, friends in other universities, people who I admired and respected, the COVID mortality was devastating so many people around me. And, and you know, good health seemed so, el so elusive uh, into the future. So I decided, you know, while I am above ground and I'm in relatively good health, I better get on with it and uh, use the opportunity of the lockdown uh, to stay in my house and uh, while running the university, writing this book. And so it was a COVID project. And at the same time, while it was meant to provide a certain kind of support for a certain kind of movement and narrative, at the same time, it was also therapy, you know, and we have to acknowledge that writers need therapy as well. So it was a kind of mental health um, strategy, but it was always in my mind germinating over decades and uh, it all came together. And the idea of having it written and launched in the 50th anniversary of Rodney's book seems such a perfect conjuncture of celebration of Walter Rodney. And just one final question then from me. Do you think we'll achieve reparations in your lifetime? You know, here's the issue. In the case of Britain, slavery was abolished in the 1830s. If you had done, Zenib, if you had done an opinion poll in, eight, in 1820, if you'll come to the Caribbean in 1820 and say to the 700,000 enslaved people, do you think you will see freedom in your lifetime? I would venture to say that 95% of them would have said no, but it happened within 10 years. But 95% I'm sure would have said we wouldn't, because we've been a slave for 300 years. How are you going to imagine you're going to get freedom in 10? The majority would have said no. I think most people today, if there were opinion polls, would probably say no, that we will not see reparatory justice in this way in our lifetimes. But take comfort in Nelson Mandela's statement. It is always impossible until it happens. And uh, history, when it begins to move, it moves swiftly and it moves very, very swiftly. So yes, I am. I am using that logic. I am saying, yes, we will see significant movement in our lifetime. Thank you, Hilary. I mean, look, for centuries, there have been calls for reparatory justice for the descendants of enslaved Africans. And I doubt that today we could find somebody more brilliant than you to um, really advance the, uh, the case and the cause. It's been a privilege and uh, to listen to you. I always come away with having learned so much and you're such an inspiration. And um, I couldn't get through all the questions because you generated so much interest, but I'm sure that there'll be many other opportunities for young students to um, pick your brains and ask you about this very, very important topic. Thank you so much. I'm gonna hand over to Professor Adam Habib now just to make a couple of closing remarks, but wasn't he brilliant, Adam? Fascinating. Thank you, Zina. Very kind of you, very generous. Thank you, Hillary. Zainab, you're absolutely right. He was. And Hillary, uh, I should start by your final question that Zainab posed. Uh, uh, you know, there was a study done in South Africa two years before Nelson Mandela was released about whether apartheid would end in 1988. And they said it's unlikely to end in their lifetime. Two years <laughs> later, Nelson Mandela was released. And four years later, we went to a democratic South Africa. So I do think your answer is a really powerful one. 
friends, colleagues, I should say the substance of Hillary's message is threefold, it seems to me. If our species is to survive the next 100 to 200 years, then it's important that the human community coheres and comes together. But if it is to come together, you can't do so without justice being at its core. And you can't get justice being at its core if we are not prepared to take accountability and responsibility for the past. And that's why reparations is so important. Reparations were granted to slave owners. Reparations were granted to the UK and Western Europe in the aftermath of the world wars. Why can it not be granted to the descendants of slaves? And what he also says is reparations is not individualized. It's fundamentally structural. It's correcting for the historical disadvantage that the peoples of the world imposed in the very way our, our global economy emerged. And so it says to me, I think it's a powerful message, Hilary Zainab. I think uh, we couldn't have done a better justice to Walter Rodney to re-articulate his message of 50 years ago, that you can't go forward, you can't go forth without reimagining the world as a more just place. So thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Zainab. I think you brought this message, this message really powerfully. This is after all on a SOAS platform. And I should say our responsibility to, is to ask global debates, global challenges, and how do we take forward global solutions? Hillary did a wonderful job on this debate. And we will be having obviously another debate in a month's time. And obviously we'll be advertising that. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to Zainab, thank you to Hillary. And may everyone have a wonderful evening today. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you, Hillary. Thanks for your kindness. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hillary. Stay in touch. Stay in touch. Thank you. Will do. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Hillary. Bye, Adam. Thanks. Bye. Bye.